Welcome, welcome everyone to the virtual premiere of the documentary film, John and Priscilla Alden, An American Story, presented by the Alden Kindred of America. My name is Desiree Mobed and I'm the executive director, together with the board of directors and over 2,500 members we preserve and share the legacy of Mayflower passengers, John and Priscilla Alden and their homestead in Duxbury, Massachusetts. As we remember the pilgrims 400 years ago this month, struggling to survive devastating hardship and loss that first winter, what a fitting moment this is to share this new documentary film that goes beyond the lore of the Alden's famous courtship story to explore their real lives. We are honored to be joined by members of our very dedicated film committee and others who have helped make this project possible. Mm. After the screening, we encourage you to ask questions by typing them into the question and answer function on your screen. We will also invite you to participate in some poll questions. If you have to leave early or would like to share this program with others, a recording will be posted on the Alden website. And now it is my honor to introduce the Alden Kindred Board President, Pauline Kieser, who will introduce this film and our panelists. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and welcome everybody. Uh, it's a beautiful day here. And this idea of the film started about five years ago. Uh, Terry Ryber was on the board of directors at the time. And he and I had a conversation with Desiree. We talked about, you know, it would be nice to have an introductory film for people who come to visit. And that the story began. And it went through a lot of different uh, labors of love and a handful of volunteers that started with a blank page, wrote a script, wrote another script, wrote another script. And finally, we are here at the day with the results. We think you'll like these results, but, and this film will be here forever. It's a wonderful treasure that you have developed for us, and we are very, very thankful. Uh, after uh, the uh, John and Priscilla really became America's first couple after Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote the book uh, and the poem, and that sold over 10,000 copies uh, in um, England. Uh, that very very first day it came out. So now this film will help us keep that America's first couple alive and well into the next century. I really need to say a great deal of thanks to all of you who have participated, in particular Terry Ryber who wrote it and directed it and a former member of the uh, Alden Kindred Board. And then there's Adrian Sumner. Adrian uh, had joined the board and she has all sorts of skills in acting and she's a travel generous, uh, journalist. And she is the uh, narrator and the commentator on this film. And she brought her husband along with her, Adam, who does Sumner film. And that combination was extremely helpful. Then there's Russell Rockwell, our dear friend and uh, now board member of the Alden Kindred, who came along with a set of skills we didn't have and became the executive producer. And the Rockwell Foundation generously helped uh, produce this film. Russell, thank you very, very much. Uh, then we have another uh, Alden uh, that came along as Alden Porter, all the way from Michigan. This is, we've got Michigan, Charleston, we're all over the United States just doing this thing virtually all the way, except on shoot day. And uh, so Alden Porter comes along and he's the producer and uh, uh, Alden volunteer from way out west and happens to drive all the way to Duxbury on perhaps the coldest weekend of the year that you could possibly shot this film. So thank you Alden for all your in input. We have Ben Alexander who was on hand. Uh, he, he works uh, locally uh, with the local cable station and he did the filming for us. And uh, then we have Carol uh, Dykstra who generously helped us uh, fund this film. Uh, we don't want to forget Christopher Lee, who's our, on, on this call, and um, our genealogist for his uh, looking to make sure it was just right. And, and Karen Bersha, who has uh, lent us her music from her group 
called Seven Times Salt. And they have an album on the music of the pilgrims. And we appreciate that very much. So I, I, I also have to add here that it wouldn't have happened without the coordinator of all of this, Desiree, our executive director, just to give you a shout out, because it's really important that you would saw the glue that kept everything together over a long journey. Thank you very, very much from the bottom of our hearts. We will be forever indebted to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pauline, for those kind words. And now um, I'm going to turn it over to our writer and director. Terry, I think it's showtime. I'm Adrian, and I'm a 12th generation Alden descendant. My ancestors, John and Priscilla Alden, are two of the most famous passengers who traveled on the Mayflower to the New World in 1620. John and Priscilla now have more than a million descendants, including famous poets, movie stars, scientists, presidents, and me. I'm standing in front of a modern replica of the Mayflower the ship that took John and Priscilla to the New World on one of the most transformative voyages in history. John was just 21 years old when he stepped aboard the ship. He was a ship's cooper hired by the captain to put supplies in barrels and safely store them on the Mayflower. Priscilla was just a teenager when she boarded the ship. Priscilla traveled with her father, mother, brother, and a servant. Her father, William Mullins, sold his prosperous shoe business and his family home in Dorking, England, with all the hopes and dreams placed in the new world. William Bradford described John as a hopeful young man, and fortunately for me, he decided to join them in the new world instead of going home to England. In September 1620, the Mayflower sailed from England to their intended destination of the Hudson River Valley in what is now the state of New York. But Mother Nature had a different plan as storms blew them off course. Despite discontented and mutinous speeches, the group came together to sign a document describing how they would govern themselves and serve in the new and strange land. Today, we remember this remarkable agreement as the Mayflower Compact. The compact has been described as the foundation for the United States Constitution, and my ancestor John signed this historic document. The ship's passage to the New World was a difficult one. They arrived at the worst possible time, the start of the New England winter. Unable to sail anywhere else because the cold and freezing weather had set in, the pilgrims needed to quickly establish a settlement. I'm standing by the marker where the pilgrims built the very first structure in Plymouth. During that horrific first winter, half of the ship's passengers and crew died from scurvy and other diseases. By spring, Priscilla had lost her father, mother, and brother, leaving her an orphan in the new world. At one point, only six passengers were able to attend to all of the others who had become bedridden with illness. Now, able-bodied men left the ship by day to build a storehouse, which was here, for their essential supplies. The men lived in the storehouse and used it as a shelter until they could build small cottages for families. When spring 1621 finally came, the Mayflower returned to England. Conditions were very grim, but both John and Priscilla stayed with the colony. This is Burial Hill, and this is where we believe John Alden lived in Plymouth. The marker is at the base of the hill where the fort was built to protect the colony. Ongoing archaeological excavation near here has revealed evidence of a 17th century house, the Palisade, and more. After a few years, life in Plymouth really did get easier. A visitor from England described Plymouth in 1623. Well situated on a high hill close to the seaside. There are about 20 houses, four or five, which are fair and pleasant, surrounded by an eight-foot palisade with goats, hogs, pigs, and hens. Gardens are enclosed in clapboard and are neat and orderly. John and Priscilla's romance is legendary. Their story was immortalized 250 years later when Alden descendant and famed poet 
Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote The Courtship of Miles Standish. According to the story, Miles Standish's wife had passed away. So the captain approached Priscilla's father to ask permission to marry his daughter. Mr. Mullins replied it was perfectly agreeable to him, but that the young lady must also be consulted. For reasons unknown, Miles Standish sent John Alden to do the asking for him. It was an odd choice, considering Alden was described as a man of most excellent form. Nevertheless, he delivered Standish's request. Priscilla considered the offer and famously replied with the words, Prithee, John, why do you not speak for yourself? Apparently, John took the hint, continued his visits, and their wedding soon followed. Today, this field behind Duxbury Public Schools plays host to various sports activities, but tucked in the corner and lying hidden underneath is a nearly 400-year-old foundation for a small home measuring just 10 and a half by 38 feet. Archaeologists discovered these remains about 60 years ago. It was here that John and Priscilla raised their 10 children, farmed, and helped establish the town of Duxbury. Now, Duxbury was the second act of the Pilgrim experience in America, and the Aldens played a crucial role in that story. As if they didn't have enough to worry about just trying to survive day to day, the colonists were also dealing with money problems. They were struggling to pay down the debt to the merchant adventurers who had financed the expedition. Now, at first they thought they could ship salted or dry fish back to England, but with no proper fishing boats and even fewer fishing skills, they soon moved on to other ventures. They looked at exporting timber and finished barrel staves, but that didn't generate enough revenue either. Eventually, the colonists turned to the fur trade, which was extremely profitable at the time. A trade with Native Americans for beaver furs could result in a thousand percent profit when resold on the docks of England. Englishmen purchased the pelts, removed the fur, and compressed it into felt to make highly fashionable hats. The Plymouth colonists established four trading posts, Penobscot, Kennebec River, Manomet River on Upper Cape Cod, and Windsor Locks, Connecticut. John's coopering skills were useful for making the casks and barrels used to store the goods they transported to the trading posts. John's trips lasted for days or even weeks at a time, and fur trading being a lucrative business also meant it was a dangerous business. There was intense competition from the French in the north, the Dutch from the south, and even Massachusetts Bay colonists from Boston. They all competed with Plymouth Colony. John and his partners kept their trading posts well guarded and remained vigilant for rivals who would steal their furs or burn their trading posts. The home site helps us understand a little bit more about Priscilla. We know her life was difficult. She had to care for 10 children while also looking after the farm since John was often absent in the fur trade and serving as a leader of the colony. From the book The English Housewife, written in 1615, we learn some of the skills she needed as the mother and mistress of the family. She must know physic, cookery, banqueting stuff, distillation, perfumes, wool, hemp, flax, dairies, brewing, baking, and all other things belonging to the household. And if that weren't enough, she must also be religious and by her example, spur all her family to pursue the same steps. An excavation at the site conducted in the 1960s provides a tantalizing glimpse into her life. Pieces of ceramics like redware milk pans were things she used to make cheese and butter. Large jars stored food for the family. A blue and green tin glazed earthenware charger decorated the wall and was used along with an expensive wine cup imported from China, no less, to serve to guests. This is the Miles Standish burial ground where the Aldens are buried with several other Mayflower passengers. Nearby is the site of the meeting house where the very first residents of Duxbury met, worshiped, and conducted town business. 
This quiet spot in the southwest corner of the cemetery is home to the gravestones of my ancestors, John and Priscilla Alden, as reminders of two lives well lived. Priscilla died sometime before John, who died at the remarkable age of 87. He was remembered as wholly humble and sincere. Beyond being a fur trader, cooper, and farmer, John Alden involved himself in the civil affairs of the colony. As a man with a reputation for serving justice impartially, he held many positions in the colonial government as assistant governor, deputy to the Plymouth Court, colony treasurer, and a member of councils of war. Situated on top of a knoll, this comfortable colonial home shared the joys and sorrows of generations of descendants of John and Priscilla, who made their living from the land, sea, trade, and military, and faced changes and challenges that shaped New England. Today, the home is owned by the Alden Kindred of America and welcomes visitors to explore one of America's founding stories through guided tours of Alden House, educational programs, events, and genealogy research. It is the only Pilgrim property that has been continuously owned by the same family and is a designated a National Historic Landmark for its exceptional importance to the history and culture of this country. We hope you'll enjoy your visit and invite you to join the Alden Kindred to help preserve the legacy of John and Priscilla for future generations. Well, Terry, thank you so much for sharing that and for um, this wonderful screening. So we're now going to have a chance to turn and uh, turn this program a little bit over to all of you who have joined us today and to share with our panelists here um, some of their thoughts and comments and answers to questions. I see people coming in, um, so we will definitely um, um, be adding them as well. And we have questions and we have comments in the chat. We also muted a lot of people. So I think we're trying to get people unmuted. Um, so give us a, a little bit of time here. But Alden Porter, who's very good at all of this, while we're transitioning, would you help me? We wanna go ahead and launch one of our poll questions. Okay, Alden, are you unmuted? I am unmuted. Yeah. All right. So while I'm making sure everyone is all set here, I want to go ahead and share one of these questions um, to um, you. And um, I think, do you see this? Um, we're going to go ahead and share this one, I think. Just a second here. Um, all right. Whoops. OK. Wait a minute. We may not yet. Oops. I keep getting my screen here. All right, go ahead. Can you all see this? Launch polling, here it comes. There you go. All right. All right, we'll give everyone a little bit of chance to, um, to answer. The first question, Alden, do you wanna go ahead and read the questions? Sure. So the first question is, are you a descendant of John and Priscilla Alden? 
We know we had some people coming in who weren't. And of course, we want to know what might have sparked your, you know, your interest in, in um, learning about this. But we also know there were a lot of Aldens who shared um, that they were attending. Look at how that polling is coming, Alden. Yeah, absolutely awesome. Yeah. So number two, what did you like about the film? You can All tell right. us in the chat or you can send an email. Yeah. And then the third question is, how did you learn about your Alden heritage? And again, you can put it in a chat or you can send us an email. Either way. Thank you. All right. And so now we... Um, I think we'll go ahead and I'm gonna end the polling and I'm gonna go ahead and share the results. Okay, Alden? Absolutely. All right. Oh my goodness. Everyone see that? Alden, you wanna go ahead and share those? Sure. So for number one, are you a descendant of John and Priscilla Alden? 73% of us on the Zoom today are descendants. Yeah. Yeah. And what really impresses me is 27% art. So welcome yes. to all of you that and aren't descendants. We really appreciate you joining us. Yes. Um, and I think now we'll get to their other questions because they're filling the chats and the questions. Right. And, all and right. actually, it's going crazy over in the chat because I have it over on the side. And okay, so good. all of you can look at the chat, right? And so... Uh, which did you like about the film? How did you learn about your heritage? Right? So I'll just read a couple of them real quick. Martha Clark says, my great grandmother did a list for the whole family. I'm descended from Ruth, number nine. Another one, uh, Gwen Cassio. I heard about this on Facebook. I like learning about the Alden's house and how Priscilla raised her children and how John provided for them. Ooh, I'd read the run for Priscilla Rose, but it's really long. Uh, here's one from Mark Jacobson. Exceptionally well done. So oh, thank we you, like folks. that one, Mark. <laughs> Keep them coming. Keep them coming. Uh, all of this is recorded, so we'll be able to look at all of it at some point. Yes, that's good. And we'll be happy to share it with you. Um, I also saw a comment about the music. And Karen, um, you're with us today <laughs> from the group Seven Times Salt. Would you like to talk a little bit about, I mean, obviously we picked from your album, but would you like to share a little bit about the music of the Pilgrim era and how that, you know, really um, helps make a video like this? Sure. Um... I'll have to choose carefully what to tell you because there's a lot I could say. <laughs> so um, I guess the short version is I I became familiar with this era of music um, way back when I worked at Plymouth Plantation as a historical interpreter and kind of had these tunes you know in my head on a daily basis. I'm also a musician and I had moved um, to Massachusetts to go to grad school for early music specifically. So I, I kind of still had all these melodies and tunes, you know, early English and Dutch music in my head. And um, in the course of grad school, we formed this group, Seven Times Salt, an ensemble to play historical music on reproduction instruments. So I guess it seemed natural that one of the first programs I thought up for a concert was hey, why don't we do all this pilgrim music that I learned? Um, so the program has actually been a long time in coming. Um, fast forward to, I guess it was a couple of years ago, um, Desiree and I met each other. And at the time, um, uh, talked about doing a live concert in 2020. Obviously, the doc that didn't come to pass, but the chance to still use this music that we had recorded um, in this film seemed like a great opportunity. So I'm I'm so pleased to see, you know, this long musical journey kind of come to fruition here. Um, just to fill in those of you who may not be familiar, um, the, the selections today are from one of our albums called Pilgrim's Progress. And the CD was recorded um, several years ago at the, um, the 1717 Meeting House in West Barnstable, so also a historic space. And if you are curious about that CD, um, which includes music and spoken word narrations um, and a little bit of artwork, uh, it's the Alden House sells it. Our website sells it, seventimesalt.com. And we would love to share more information for anyone who's interested in the music of this time period. There, I hope that was short enough. <laughs> oh, Karen, thank you so much. It, I just love the way it, it complements the images and the story. 
story of this. And we know, you know, I think I told you this, that um, I think it's the fifth generation of Aldens we know. Um, there was a Pfeiffer in the revolution and then the violinist. And so you just think about um, music and how much, you know, that would have meant to them. Um, in that time and what they had available. So now I know we should move on to some of the other questions here. We'll get um, going because um, we're just happy to have um, your interest and enthusiasm for this. Um, there's one from Sarah. You see Priscilla with the spinning wheel and when did that craft come? So a lot of those images are turn of the century images. Um, around the time of the colonial revival period when, of course, you know, they would have assumed that everyone would have been a spinner. Um, probably, um, although they certainly were very skilled at, at um, making linen from flax and, and knitting and so forth, there were historians, I do believe there were no um, spinning wheels that came over on the Mayflower, possibly some very small um, hand ones, um, but you do see them in the inventories um, it, with that second generation. So um, their son, Jonathan, did have a spinning wheel. So probably they were too busy um, in those first years to spin because it's so time consuming, but that would have been added. And it just, the pictures are there because that was part of how they thought of the pilgrims from that time period. All right, so Terry, I think you wanted to take on the question about the courtship. Do you want to share that one? Well, what was the question? Oh, you said you were going to answer that one live. Um, let's see. I think it was, maybe it was in the chat, about um, Priscilla asking, um, uh, being asked, or her hand in marriage being asked by Miles and her father giving the um, okay. Yeah, I think that? someone pointed out in yeah. when the Q&A, which was an excellent observation, and I just yes. had that observation about a week ago myself, was that, in the courtship story, Miles Standish asked Mr. Mullins for, for Priscilla's hand in marriage. But then the question was, well, if Mr. Mullins died, I think in about February, how mm -hmm. could that have happened? I mean, realistically, this is a story that's been passed down through generations. And then Longfellow wrote his poem about it. So there, there could be a little bit of, you know, creative, uh, uh, cre creative, options taken and how the story panned out. I mean, I don't know if we'll ever know if that story is absolutely 100% true, but I mean, we can credit Longfellow with really putting John and Priscilla on the map. And that's why we included the, the poem in, in the story, basically. I hope yeah, that for answers. those of you who I know have done all of this research, we do think they were married by 1623. That land division no longer shows Priscilla um, separately. Um, but, you know, beyond that, you know, there's no record of the date of their marriage, unfortunately, um, at least that's been discovered up to this point. Okay, so the next question, I think, is um, some of the background images. Russell, do you want to try to take that one? Because you were the one that did so much research and edited um, the images for this film, and they really are just beautiful and uh, crisp. Um, so that's thanks, great. Ms. Ray. And, and I want to thank Pauline while I've got her here for uh, uh, allowing us to do this production uh, and, and supporting us throughout the whole, the whole deal. And it was great, great honor for me to work with such a creative team of Terry and, and uh, Adrian and Adam and, uh, and Alden and uh, all the others. Um, but as far as the images go, um, they came from a variety of sources. Um, a, a lot of them uh, I, I researched through the Library of Congress, and, and uh, there's options at the Library of Congress to download uh, certain images and certain sizes. So, so uh, uh, I, got, I got a lot from there. Uh, other images were taken from the, um, what is it, Pilgrim Hall. Uh, the paintings um, were taken from P P Pilgrim Hall. Um, there's some other images from state parks, uh, the one of John Alden uh, um, up on the, I mean, not John, Alden, but one of uh, Miles Standish um, on, uh, uh, on his uh, statue on his podium um, that was taken from the state park. Uh, and then there were various other places that, 
that we received a, a number of uh, 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 photographs and images. And there's a, if you look at the end of the film, you'll see a lot of credits to a lot of uh, organizations and individuals who supplied us those images. And uh, we're very grateful to them for helping um, make what uh, uh, I'm proud to say, uh, I'm proud to have my name on this film. Thank you, Russell. I, I, we have to add, of course, that thanks to the Library of Congress, which was open, many of these places and resources weren't during over this past year, of course, because of the COVID um, situation. So it made it a little extra difficult and challenging, but we got them. <laughs> and people were incredibly, incredibly generous. And I do want to also, Russell mentioned Pilgrim Hall. Donna was on this um, a program a few minutes ago. Thank you to Pilgrim Hall. Thank you so much to Plymouth Patuxet, formerly Plymouth Plantation, that just was so very generous with images. Um, and I also want to add an extra thanks to the Pilgrim John Howland Society um, for sharing a couple of the paintings that they have, especially the one of the fur trade um, space. And their um, they also allowed us a trip on their wonderful shallop to be part of the film. So they were just super. All right, moving on to other questions. We have um, another question, I believe, about uh, lineage. Christopher, that's you. They want to know how many Alden descendants there are. Oh, Christopher, you're not. You got to unmute. There we you go. know that there are well over a million, um, but as to a, a specific number, we don't know. Um, we have heard estimates as high as six and eight million descendants of the Aldens. Um, we've heard estimates between 10 and 35 million descendants of Mayflower passengers. Um, but so there's no definitive answer to that question, but it is in the millions. And Christopher, which uh, family or kindred has the uh, distinction of having the most? We would like to believe that's the Aldens. Um, <laughs> it may be the Howlands. It's competitive. Um, <laughs> but for the sake of our call, we'll say the Aldens today. Oh, that's, um, yes. All right. We like that answer, Christopher. That's... Um, that is, um, and has there been any new um, findings on um, learning more about William Mullins and his wife um, and their, that you know of, learning more about their lineage? Sure. The most significant study of William Mullins is by a now quite well-known Mayflower genealogist, uh, Caleb Johnson and appears in the, uh, uh, the American Genealogist and uh, more recently in the Alden Silver Books. Um, so it discusses Mullins' uh, career and properties in Dorking and a little bit of movement around Dorking, um, some uh, interaction with the uh, with sort of legal entanglements uh, as well in, in Surrey and the in south of London area. Um, we have not yet confirmed. Uh, in fact, we think there, we're, we have reason to believe from Caleb's research and the research of others that Alice, who accompanied him as his wife on the Mayflower, uh, may not have been the mother of Priscilla. Uh, so we don't know that with absolute certainty, but there's reason to believe Alice was not Priscilla's mother. Um, and at the same time, there is a suggestion that Alice may have been uh, either a relative or a relative by marriage of another Mayflower passenger, Peter Brown, who would also ultimately uh, settle in Duxbury. So Christopher, you know, inquiring minds want to know, Priscilla didn't want to marry Miles, and apparently she didn't want to marry her, her um, Peter Brown either, also from Dorking. John got the, got, <laughs> John must have been quite something. He must have been something. <laughs> um, interestingly, Peter Brown names one of his daughters Priscilla, uh, and I believe he's the only Mayflower passenger other than the Aldens uh, who, who, 
carry that name in the uh, what you could call the, the second generation. So another I could be wrong about that, but I think so. <laughs> Thank you, Christopher. Um, there's a question about the bodies of John and Priscilla. Were they ever exhumed? And how do we know that they're there in Duxbury? Does anyone want to take that on? Any of the panelists? Anyone want to try that one? I know that they, uh, the stones were put up by the kindred many years ago that uh, mark the graves now. The bodies were not exhumed, unlike poor Miles, who I believe has been, um, that's I think they've exhumed him, I think, three times, maybe. Um, but uh, typically, families tended to bury bodies near each other. So we know that the stone of their son, Jonathan Alden, is a stone that was there. And so it's assumed that they are nearby. Um, but the stones are, are commemorative, and they don't mark the actual spot in those days, uh, cemeteries were they didn't really put up gravestones or, and if they did they probably made them of wood so they would not have lasted um and let's see um when did descendants begin to settle outside of new england terry do you want to take that one on terry did we lose terry terry oh there he is the question is, when did the when did they start moving outside of New England? The descendants. Uh, I don't really know. I okay, let's give those. that one to Christopher. I think that's a another more of a lineage question. Christopher, are you still there? I am. Yes. So you have a number of the children of John and Priscilla who immediately move out of Plymouth uh, in their lifetimes. Uh, they go to Little Compton, which was then another Plymouth colony town and is now in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, John Alden, the son of John and Priscilla, some know as, uh, and I saw a question in the chat about his entanglements during the Salem witch trials, but he becomes a, uh, a merchant, a trader. He's up in what is now Maine, um, all still New England, but by the third generation, we start seeing movement outside of New England um, in, into New Jersey, uh, which became uh, sort of a settlement of a number of New Englanders among the Dutch that were widely settled there, uh, as well as a bit further afield. So third generation, we start seeing that movement outside of New England among the Alden descendants. We actually see it somewhat earlier among some of the other Mayflower families. So, um, thank you, Christopher. Another question is, um, was Priscilla taken in by another family after the passing of her parents? And do you know who that would be? Adrian, I think you and I once had this conversation, um, if you remember, and we counted up the number of married women who survived and figured, right, it might have been one of those. Oh, you're muted, just a minute. We're gonna unmute you. Just a second, Adrian, sorry. Wait a minute. She's still, oh, sorry about this. She's still muted. Okay, can you there hear me? There she is. Hi. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry I'm in the car, but um, I think Christopher is too, so I'm not the only one. Um, <laughs> yes, so there, um, I believe early on there were only five women who survived um, that first winter. It was a very, very challenging winter. The women, the men tended to go on to shore. They were drinking clean water and, and building and um, the settlement that would be there. And so it was just uh, the women that were still on board. And that first winter, 78% of the women died. They survived the journey over, but it was that first winter that was really difficult where the women were the caretakers. They had to stay on the ship an additional four months in very difficult conditions. And so because of that, um, they, they passed. And so there were only five women who survived that first winter. And one of them actually passed due to a broken heart. And that was 
is it Catherine Carver or Elizabeth Carver? That was, um, Elizabeth, yes, John Carver's wife, Catherine, right. John Carver's yeah. wife, yes, due to, yes. a, they say, due to a broken heart because he passed. So then there were only four women left. And um, so it had to have been one of them, I expect. Yeah, because um, they were family Priscilla units. was not counted in that number. Right. But yeah, Priscilla was not counted in that number because she was still a teenager at the time. So she was counted with the children who were the vast majority of who survived that first year. Thank you, Adrian. One of the stories we love to share, too, with visitors is if you think about it, you know, that first famous Thanksgiving was, you know, probably in part cooked and planned by those four married women. <laughs> Oh, four with women ma with many helpers that. I know but yes, yes. we love to <laughs> but that's true I thought I thought about that only four women would have been handling yeah. all that and I'm sure some of the Wampanoag women maybe had come as oh, well yes. and maybe were a part yes. of that and and they were probably all shaking their heads at the men not helping yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so a question about militia duty and that's a very that's a wonderful question i don't know if any of our panelists want to take that on one of the treasures in the alden archaeological artif archaeological artifacts and we have on exhibit right now is um four pieces of a snap hans musket and a gun fork um, and a pike. Each man between the ages of 16 and in his 60s was required to be part of the militia. Uh, John would have had to learn, um, you know, to um, to handle that role. Um, also, of course, you know, they would need a musket for hunting. So he would have had to participate. Um, his sons would have participated. Um, but, it, you know, it depended on where you were when you were needed. So we don't know you know, which events, you know, he participated in. Um, and we do, um, but we do treasure those, those objects. And they are absolutely amazing. And it's really, uh, it's very special um, to have, um, you know, some of those odd things that belong to John and Priscilla. So, um, and they are on exhibit when you come visit the house. That was one of our uh, 400th of that. So, so another question about the Alden House and um, the numbers of Alden Houses, which is another very good question. Um, that the house that you see today was, was built by the descendants and remodeled by the descendants. They lived there till the 1920s. Um, that's, um, and you know, now of course it's a museum, but um, it's probably, it's you know, we're, we're pretty sure it's not the house where John and Priscilla would have raised their children. That was an earlier house, 10 and a half by 38 feet, roughly, is the foundation. If you do the math, that's about 400 square feet, which is not a lot to divide for 10 children, <laughs> if, um, even in those very, um, you know, different times. But um, that, we think, was where they raised their family. They may have had an even earlier house that they had started um, before um, they built the 10 and a half by 38. So, um, but again, all nearby, we're very grateful that that, um, you know, to have those, those pieces of their lives. Um, so what email can we send our feedback to? And that would be, um, you can send it to info at alden.org. Um, so, Christopher, another genealogy question. They want to know about Miles Standish and Sarah, and uh, Miles Standish, Alexander, and Sarah. Is Christopher still there with us? Yes. If yep. you, okay. If you, if you follow the Longfellow tale, uh, Priscilla chose John rather than, than Captain Standish, but... Uh, Priscilla and John's daughter, Sarah, would go on to marry Alexander Standish, uh, one of several marriages by Alexander Standish, which was the elder son, the elder surviving son of Miles Standish and his, ultimately his heir uh, to purported lands in Britain. Um, but many of the descendants of Miles Standish through son Alexander share in the Alden heritage through uh, John and Priscilla's daughter, Sarah Alden Standish. Yes, that's sort of a fun uh, family, a next generation story. If Miles 
and John were missed at each other about Priscilla, clearly they resolved it by the next generation. <laughs> Um, another question about John Jr. and the witchcraft trials. Um, there's a lot of information. There's a testimony of the trial online, which I highly recommend that you check out if you're interested in that story. His is a very interesting story. Um, and how about now we talk a little bit about filming the film. Anyone want to share? Alden Porter, do you want to share a little bit about our experiences that weekend of um, getting the footage for this? Sure. So it was a blustery, cold New England weekend. Okay. So all of us that were working on the film froze our tushes off. I, I'm not exaggerating. I mean, ask Adrian, right? She was freezing to death. She was always in front of the camera, right? She was freezing to death. But it was a wonderful experience. We went out on a shallop out in the bay. Uh, we went to Connecticut to see the restoration work of uh, the Mayflower II. And we learned a lot of things along the way because none of us are really professionals at this, right? Some of us had some experience, but we are not professionals. Russell was the closest that came. We were so glad he joined us later on, right? Because he was the closest that came to this, right? Um, and so we did things like we started out, for example, uh, having big cards, big poster boards for the script. Didn't work so well. Eventually, we found a way to put it on an iPad and it scrolled and it went much smoother that way. That's just a couple of things. I know Terry and Adrian and, and Desiree have some comments as well. Um, Adrian, how about you? You're the one that had to be in front of the camera with um, in the, despite all of those challenging conditions. <laughs> You have anything, any memories you want to share about that? No, I think we may have lost Adrian. Terry, how about you? Well, I'll throw in a few notes. I mean, first of all, before we even got to the point of shooting, it was two years in the making of the of the script. We did about a year's research, and um, we did very detailed research. We had our all our information that film was revert was uh, reviewed by Jim Baker and. Um, I, I can't remember his name, the gentleman. Tom who's, McCarthy. Tom McCarthy, yeah. who's the, our official historian. So everything was was reviewed to the, like almost like how many angels fit on, on the head of a pen, I used to tell people. Like we, we even discussed things like, did they refer to the Thanksgiving as a Thanksgiving, a giving of thanks, a festival of everything in this film was 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 researched to the to the minute detail because we wanted to make sure that we told the true story, not not the sort of allegorical or folk folkloric story, but we we felt that the, that the facts would be more interesting than fiction. So about two years went into the research and the writing of the script, and of course by the time we got to the day of filming, it was for me it was great. It was like after two years of working on this, we're actually finally filming. And of course, Adrian did an awesome job. She, she always looked great. She showed up. She always looked great. We sometimes made some changes in wording just before she stepped up in front of the camera. We literally cha made changes in wording. And I'll have to say, Adrian and I were absolutely simpatico. It was almost like we were brother and sister that we both agreed immediately to each other's suggested changes. And then she went out and delivered them, you know, while uh, other other people or, or Alden Porter was, of course, freezing, holding the teleprompter that we literally rewrote the stuff on the teleprompter. But it was it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was really great, you know, and, and it was and there was a ton of work that was done by Russell and and, and by, you know, um, everyone to to get the images together um, Desiree as well I mean it was the, the images and the paintings they found were absolutely gorgeous and they were able to lay those into the film and then of, of course you know we had edited and um, Jim drawing I'm bad on names but um, Adam Adam sorry Adam did an awesome job videoing he's a professional video editor and he kind of took a kind of a ragtag ideas and footage and kind of hammered it into a cohesive show. So we're, we're very happy with it. And uh, I think it's going to stand the test of time. I hope that, you know, a hundred years from now, people will still be watching this show, you know. Thank you, Adrian, Terry. I'd like to add to that if I could. Can oh, yes. Yeah. Um, 
The second day of shooting was done in Connecticut at the Mystic Seaport, because that's where Mayflower 2 had been refurbished and just really kind of launched. And so um, Christopher Lee came by and, and he and I went over for that second day of shooting. It was freezing. I mean, absolutely freezing. I fortunately brought Lydia Alden's red cape with me, which is a, a circa 1730 cape. Uh, she, she actually is born in the Alden house and, and it's a treasure that I wear from time to time. I will tell you, it worked. <laughs> it's the only thing that kept me warm. In fact, I even threw it over uh, Adrian's shoulders for a bit because she was shivering so much. Uh, but it gave me a chance to see firsthand just all the work come together. And that was really terrific and oh there's somebody put up a picture of us out there and that's when she has the Lydia Alden's cape on well uh afterwards I just as a, a a bit of humor we went to lunch and where do you think we picked to go we went to Mystic Pizza because of course that major film Mystic Pizza was uh filmed there so the film crew went to the film site and we all had a wonderful day and I think it brought it all together and it was just uh I was so happy that I could have been there that day. Thank you, guys. It was really good, too. <laughs> and a shout out to Ben Alexander, who is the cinematographer on this. He's also an, not an Alden descendant, but he's a Mayflower descendant. And uh, he, he really was very patient working with us and very easygoing to work with. So we, we, had, we were in good hands there, I thought. So we have another really good um, question about the history. And that is for anyone who would like to take this on, the Mullins are often listed as adventurers, but appear to have connections with the separatists, the saints. Um, is there any clear idea of which camp they belonged to? Uh, I'm would willing you like to, to answer try that, that Terry? Yeah. 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 I mean, these are, you know, these are tough questions, of course, whether, you know, the, the courtship story is true or not. You know, I kind of knew these questions were going to come up. Yeah. And then the other question of, of whether Priscilla and her family were actually saints or strangers. I mean, there's very limited evidence that would point to, to the Mullins being uh, saints. There is, for instance, he was uh, arrested at one point. Mr. Mullins and also formed what's called the Franken Pledge, which basically means if anyone in your group does something wrong, you all get blamed for it. So it was a way to corral them and get them to behave a certain way. So there is some slight circumstantial evidence that might indicate that they were saints or at least had had that sort of uh, proclivity and, and perhaps were trying to escape or, or go to the new world. But on the other hand, you know, um, Mr. Mullins was a very prosperous uh, uh, merchant and he owned a shoe business with his brother and he basically sold his, his piece of the shoe business and his house and everything. And he bought nine shares in, in, you know, in, in the, the whole operation. So most people coming on would be awarded one share and pay like 10 pounds to, to get on the boat, sort of a boarding fee. He paid 90 pounds and bought nine shares. So I think he was pretty bullish on, on the idea of America and what it could be and the opportunities here. He even brought shoes because he thought, hey, you know, to every cobbler, every problem is a shoe. You know, every answer, every problem is a shoe. So he brought like 100 pairs of shoes. He, he, he was the only true investor that stepped on the boat. His whole family went on the boat. All the other investors stayed in England. You know, but he was a, a true investor and he brought his old family and of course they, they literally paid with their lives. So I would like to think that, that he had a vision for what America could be. And it was really only through Priscilla that she actually was the one that lived out his dream because all the rest of them died. She stayed and yet she was able to make this huge lineage by having 10 kids. And of course her and her husband were, you know, really key in, paying off the debts and, and, and helping to get the land division to occur so they could all get their own land. So in, in a way, I think Priscilla represents his vision. That's how I think of it. I think he's actually a very strong figure in this in some way. Like I, I almost felt intuitively that he could be like a visionary as to what America could be. And it was Priscilla and, and John who, who, who really lived that vision. And how would they have ever known that a 17-year-old girl would live this amazing vision that was happening for the new world. Thank you, Terry. That's, uh, that was a very nice. 
a good response. Um, so we do have several questions, Terry, while you're on <laughs> right now um, about um, seeing the film again. I do want to note that we are recording this program, which we will be posting through social media and on the Alden website in its entirety um, over the weekend. And then, Terry, do you want to talk about um, sharing the video after that? Well, I think our plans are, of course, to put up this whole show we're having here so people can see it this weekend. We're also hoping to put the video itself up on YouTube. Um, Russell is also, Russell Rockwell, the, the executive producer, is looking at entering this film into various film competitions in New England and around the U.S. So we're going to see what kind of play it gets there. It's also going to be show, shown to um, visitors that come to the to the Alden House, they'll go into the barn, they'll, they'll, they'll watch the film as a bit of an introductory, and then they'll go on the tour and they can walk out to the first site. So the idea of it, and, and, and I think it's going to be used by teachers as well in classrooms. So I think this is going to go a long way to keep the story alive. You know, and I think right now is just a great time. It couldn't have been a better time to launch this because I think people really want to see, you know, the, the kind of values that the Aldens represent. To, to be promulgated and, and, and to use the story to promulgate the, their values out to the world. So uh, again, it's gonna be on the website, it's gonna be YouTube available, we're gonna be showing it in the barn and it's gonna be used in schools and we're going into competition. So I'm kind of hoping this is gonna get some real legs and, you know, and, and I think it's gonna do a lot to keep the story alive. Plus it's gonna be on my Facebook account and on my private website and on LinkedIn and everywhere else I can think to share this film. Thank you all very, very much. All right, um, uh, yes, I, Russell, did I hear you? No, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, oh, say, go ahead, sorry, Russell. There was uh, some discussion about the production uh, earlier and, all, and some stories about that. Uh, I just I wanted to make sure there was a shout out to uh, to, to, to Desiree uh, um, for her, her and putting us all together. Um, filmmaking is uh, the most collaborative art form there is. And, and a lot of time it ends up being kind of like herding cats. <laughs> a cat herder. Uh, and I want to thank her efforts in, in trying to keep this whole thing on track and keep moving in the right direction. Anyway, thanks. That's oh. great, Russell. In fact, there's a Thank variety you. of different personalities that Desiree had to manage, and she did a fine job. Oh. <laughs> so Mind I would say <laughs> <laughs> one of the challenges of you know a, a project like this for a small group like ours is we never actually have all been together in person to be able to really talk about it and work it out. You know, we've had to use all the wonderful remote communication systems, which are great, but sometimes not so great. And, um, but this is, has been such a, a fabulous group and, you know, just very, really good in terms of, you know, trying new ideas, you know, from Terry's willingness to rewrite the script to Russell always going saying, I think I can find that photo for you. And uh, I think Adam is off the line, but his incredible patience at editing this and pulling it all together. And Ben Alexander, who shot the video, um, never said no to us, no matter what. So, you know, there's just, um, it's been a great, great project. We're very proud of it. I think it will answer a real need for us at Alden House. We, visitors come and they want to know more about John and Priscilla, and this will help um, fill those gaps. So if um, Pauline, would you like to go ahead and say anything more before we close this out? Pauline, there yep. she is. I'm here. Uh, I'd just like to say it's uh, been a good day and a good day for the Aldens. And, you know, just by launching this uh, film at this time, it's, it's particularly significant because we're about to make another major a, uh, announcement in just a month and so, so stay tuned for what we envision for the Alden Kindred and the Alden site and how we are going to create the Living History Museum and this will be a part of it but we're also going to be 
going from timber to technology and uh, making sure that our story is shown and heard and felt all over the world. And we need to do it more than ever right now. Thank you all for coming and have a good day. Thank you all again for joining this program. Again, we are recording it. It will be posted on the Eldon website um, and available through social media. Please share it with your family and friends. Please visit us at the Alden House this season. Join more of our virtual programs and consider being a member to help us preserve and share the legacy of Alden House, John and Priscilla um, for the next generations. Good day, you all, and thanks again.